This is the AIMA T9, an affordable integrated amplifier that's so popular that the company can barely keep it in stock. Now, lucky for me, I was able to buy one off Amazon a month ago, so today I thought I would share what my experience has been like with this little guy. The long story short is, the good has been really good, but the bad, well, it's been pretty bad. So let's talk about that. So real talk, I know why you clicked on this video. Now instead of doing the typical YouTuber thing to where I make you wait until the end of this video before finally revealing why I'm putting out a buyer's beware on the T9, I'm just going to tell you right up front. But before I do, I need to lay down a very important disclaimer first. Some of you are going to interpret this video as a hit piece against Cheap Audio Man because he's the guy who's raved about the T9, he's inspired many people, to include myself, to rush out and buy one, and I think some people after watching this video are either going to think that this is designed to undermine his credibility or just the opposite, you're going to become enraged that he would promote this kind of a product, so you're going to rush to his channel and just talk a bunch of mess to him. Please don't do that. I know Randy. I think he's a genuine guy. I don't always agree with his assessments, but I think they come from an honest place. So I'm pretty confident that if he ran into issues with the T9, he would have told you about them. But the reality is this. I bought mine off of Amazon. I've run into problems, and it's my job to report those problems to you. Doing anything less than that is purely disingenuine. So with that out of the way, let's move on. And here's the game plan. I'm going to start off with the issues I've run into, starting with the most innocuous problems, and then I'm going to progress towards the more serious issues. So the first problem I want to talk about is IEMA's power specifications. I don't think they're very, being very honest with the public about that. Because when you go to their Amazon page or their website, they advertise that the T9 is capable of outputting 100 watts per channel into 4 ohms. Which even for a Class D amplifier, that's quite a bit for a compact little component. Now, being the audiophile I am, I was curious about what the power output is into 8 ohms, so I reached out to them and they responded back to me and said that, okay, so the output into 8 ohms is 25 watts per channel, which seems very appropriate. But then I thought, well, wait a second. How can you be 25 into 8 ohms and then 100 into 4 ohms? That's not even possible. What I'm guessing is going on is that it's around 25 into 8 ohms, maybe 50-ish into 4 ohms, and they just combine the per channel number into total output into 4 ohms, uh, just to make it look better, because that's what sells more units. But the bottom line is that I wish they were a little bit more honest with their customers about the real world power output. Now, to be fair, this is when independent measurements become very valuable. Next, let's move on to a problem I think many of you would have with the T9, especially if you ran into this issue, which is clicking noise. So when I got in the T9, I connected it to my desktop system, and I noticed something. Whenever I was playing music through it, it sounded great. Well, at least while it was working. We'll get to that in just a bit. But as soon as it stopped playing music, as soon as there was no longer signal coming to it, it started clicking. Let me show you what I mean. Yeah, that's pretty annoying. And what's also concerning is that you'll notice that the VU meter blips a little bit every time it clicks. Now, it could be a relay issue. It could be a number of different problems. Now, I found it to be annoying, but not necessarily a deal killer per se, just because the sound is so good and you actually enjoy it when it's playing music. But still, it's something worth noting. So I reached out to Aima again and I said, hey, this is what I'm running into. Is this a known issue? And they said, yes, it is a known problem and it's something that they're working on. Which tells me I'm not the only person who's probably ran into this. And I'm guessing other people will as well. So it's just something for you to be aware of. And then after this, well, this is when we've run into some pretty serious issues. The next problem I ran into is that after about four days of use, I noticed that when I would go to turn the volume down, it would have trouble doing so. Sometimes it would get confused, and instead of adjusting the volume, it would try to switch inputs, in my case, to Bluetooth, and it wouldn't allow me to lower the volume anymore. That's not good, but it was intermittent. So, after about four or five days of listening to it in a desktop system, I decided, okay, it's time to move it to my big system so I can evaluate it with a number of different speakers. 
I moved it over, I turned on the system, started playing music, and oh my god, I thought I broke my speakers, which at the time, I had the Klipsch Forte 4 set up. Those are expensive speakers, and all I heard out of them was just pure distortion. Oh my god. So obviously I turn off the integrated and make sure all the cables are you know connected correctly. There's nothing going on. There's nothing touching, so on and so forth. Everything looks good. I even swap out the cables. I turn the unit on and off again. It's the same problem. Every time signal plays, it's just a lot of distortion. So that is when I decided to finally just call it quits because that's the kind of thing that can break your speakers. And in my case, those are very, very expensive speakers. I do not want to go there. And that, in total, is what's led me to post up this video. And I really don't like doing this because it's such a good sounding unit when it works. I understand why Randy is just in love with this thing. And I was so excited myself to tell you all about it. Like, oh my God, just buy it. Like, if you have a budget of a hundred something bucks for a small system, desktop rig, whatever, buy it. But now that I've run into these issues, what I can advise you to do is if you do want to try out this unit, is if you have a set of, say, junky speakers hanging around your home, speakers you don't care for, I would connect the IMA T9 to those speakers first, run it for four or five days, and just observe if you run into any problems. If you run into any of the issues that I've reported, then go ahead and return it. Now, if you don't run into any problems, then maybe you're lucky. Maybe you have a perfectly functioning piece, connect it to the speakers you intended to use it with, and then enjoy because you just got a great value for the money. But unfortunately, I do have to put out this buyer's beware video because I ran into some pretty alarming problems that I think you all should know about. So that is pretty much it for the warning section of this video. If this is all that you're really interested in, this is enough for you, then thanks for tuning in. But if you're curious about what my impressions are of the T9 when it was actually functioning just fine and why I said it sounds so good to my ears, then stick around. I'm just going to give you a brief overview of how I feel it performs. Obviously, because I have a faulty unit, which I already returned, by the way, as of filming this video, um, I can't give you a detailed assessment. It's going to be just a general overview, kind of like my After the Hype videos. So if you're down to hear that, by all means, stick around. But otherwise, yeah, let's get to it. God, I always lose it at the very end of the, my rants. <laughs> God, let's move on. Okay, so because this is not a formal review, I'm going to keep my observations short and sweet. So there are many reasons why I like the T9. The first is that it doesn't sound like a typical Class D amplifier, by which I mean it doesn't have a thin and dry sounding mid-range. If anything, it sounds like a really good Class A B amp. And to get that for something that costs 130 bucks, never mind with a lot of features, it's pretty awesome. The second thing I like about it is how it reveals detail. It's not unusual to find detailed products, even for a hundred bucks, but this reveals detail in a way that reminds me of $1,000 integrated amplifiers. I kid you not. It gives everything its own sense of space. It is incredibly easy to make out micro details, and then there's actually pretty good tone. And you hear this with, say, piano. A lot of budget pieces really struggle with piano. It can make it sound bloated or thin or harsh or grainy, but the T9 handles it like a proper entry-level high-end integrated amplifier. There's a tack to the notes, but there's also decay, and that really took me by surprise because, as I like to say, I'm pretty big on tone, whatever that means, right? So... Beyond that, I'm also impressed with the overall presentation of it because it does have a slightly, what I would define as a slightly energetic sound. It makes the speaker sound as though you're sitting maybe just a row or two closer to the live performance. Again, it's not a big exciting sound, but there's just a little bit extra there. The treble feels like it may be just a little bit accentuated, the same with the bass. But overall, the bass is very strong. The mid-range doesn't sound thin. I would even go so far as to say pretty balanced and almost neutral with maybe a hit of warmth. And then to treble, there's a little bit of energy there. But it, outside of when you first power it on, it can sound a little bit um, budget-ish and edgy around the notes. 
but as soon as you let it warm up for about 30 minutes, that tends to smoothen out and you're just left with a pretty good treble presentation for something in its price range. There's some energy and bite there. You can listen to rock and roll music and hear the scream of a guitar, but it's not like overly etched and, you know, fatiguing. So I think they just struck such a fine balance here. And then another thing that's great about it are the tone controls, which are actually very effective. You want less treble, you just you know, adjust the tone control and you get less treble. I mean, and it actually works. It doesn't seem to really distract from the overall presentation. And I know plenty of expensive products in the hi-fi space that can't even pull that off. So this video is just such a shame because the T9 is such a special unit for $130. And for those of you out there who bought one and you've had no issues, congratulations. You have a killer value on your hands. Now, before I close this video, let's go over my observations as to how it compares to some other products. First, let's talk about the Yamaha 202 stereo receiver, which I also think is a good product. It's $200 now, so almost twice the price of the T9. Now, to be entirely honest with you, I think the T9 is better in pretty much every way. I think it's far more detailed. It could power forum speakers all day long, whereas the Yamaha really can't do that. And I think the overall presentation is just on a higher level. Pretty much the only advantage that the Yamaha may have on a subjective level is it does have that big muscular sounding mid-range and the treble is inherently smooth, maybe a little bit rough around the edges. It is a budget piece, but it's something that you can listen to almost like the worst of recordings through the Yamaha and still end up enjoying the sound, especially if you have kind of rolled off sounding speakers. The T9 is going to be a little bit more revealing in that regard. But otherwise, the T9, just from a pure raw performance standpoint, I think is going to be better than the Yamaha. Next, let's talk about how it compares to something that's a lot more expensive, like my favorite under $1,000, the IOTA VXSA3. Let me be incredibly real with you all. I think there are many people out there who would actually prefer the sound of the T9 over the IOTA VXSA3. And that's because it has that detail. The way it reveals that detail is quite frankly, it just sounds higher end than the SA3. The SA3 has good detail, but it doesn't have that degree of separation that the T9 has. It doesn't have the delicacy around the notes that the T9 has. And plus the T9 just overall has that cleaner presentation, a little bit more of a lively sound when compared to the IOTA VX. However, the IOTA VX is still the more versatile piece and I personally still prefer the SA3, although not by a huge margin, I still prefer the SA3 just because I noticed that when I switched to it, my ears felt more relaxed and at ease. I felt like I could listen to the music for a longer period of time through the SA3 because the treble is just a little bit less on my face. The treble on the SA3 is a little smoother and the sound is just a little more balanced, a little less V curve. But otherwise, guys, the T9 is very impressive when it works. So my game plan is this. I've already sent the unit back to them. So I'm going to keep in contact with the company. And once I hear that they've solved the clicking problem, I'm going to request a review sample. I'm going to revisit it and see if any of those problems have been addressed. And if so, perhaps I'll come back and give it more of a formal review. But these are my general impressions of the unit in terms of performance. And this video has been a summary of my entire experience with the T9. Again, very frustrating, a fantastic sounding unit when it works, but obviously you're rolling the dice with it. So anyways, that is my take on this integrated amp. As always, thanks for watching and until next time, peace.